All right, welcome to the lecture on ecosystems. This is going to cover uh, the E.O. Wilson reading on Hawaii, and we're going to talk about uh, bio, both ecosystems, both from a biological perspective and from a conceptual perspective. Okay, so I want you to think about, first off, uh, ecosystems as a biological or a scientific term. Okay. Welcome to the lecture on ecosystems. Um, we're going to look at ecosystems both from a biological perspective and from a conceptual perspective. And we're going to, um, in the course, I'll talk about ecosystems or oftentimes systemic thinking is kind of interrelated concepts. So um, ecosystems. So from a biological perspective or a scientific perspective, uh, we can define them in um, two ways here. One is a unit of interdependent organisms sharing the same habitat. Or two, a system formed by the interaction of a community, or a community of organisms with their physical environment. So um, I think if you look at these two, one of them that's a, a little more inclusive, I think, is the second one, uh, because it recognizes that it's the interaction between the organisms and the environment. And in some ways, it's the interaction of the organisms that create the environment. So you're trying to think about the whole and how the, the parts within that whole interact in a way that create the dynamic properties of that whole. So the example one that we're going to focus on is the one used by E.O. Wilson, um, and that is Hawaii. And Hawaii works well because it's um, isolated in some, to some extent, so it's a little easier to define where the boundaries of that ecosystem are. Um, and then I'll use the term ecosystems a little more loosely um, to help us conceptualize um, what I think of as systems thinking or systems theory, and I'll give you some specific principles about what that entails. So one thing from the ecological or the systems theory perspective is you understand reality is made up of um, processes more than specific things. So if you think about, for example, the human body, you can think about the body as a collection of different organs or different uh, tissues, um, but really the it needs to be understood as a dynamic process. Um, in other words, a body that doesn't have anything moving or doesn't have any energy flows in or out, we would call dead. And most of us don't think of that as the human condition. We think about the body in that dynamic form where it's engaged with its environment and it's trading oxygen and carbon dioxide, it's heat regulation, there's um, regulation related to other social systems, other people, um, but it's a, it takes on its characteristics and it has its fundamental being in terms of a process as opposed to a static state. Um, a second point is that within systems thinking we understand reality as networked. So in other words, who you are or what you are is comprised um, almost more by the relationships that you're nested in as opposed to something that exists in the abstract. So you would understand, so a simple comparison might be between um, understanding the person as something that's separate uh, from the community or understanding the community kind of comes first and a person emerges from within that um, network of relationships that defines the community. And then the third point is that you have uh, recursivity or in other words systems within So a recursive system is one where there's systems within systems. So if you think about like a human, uh, an individual person, uh, within them you have uh, the cardiac system, you have the immune system, you have the digestive system, you have uh, a number of systems and then those systems have components, they have tissues and the tissues are made up of cells, etc. So it's seeing that reality is not flat, it's there's pieces within things and we'll talk through this as we go and it'll make more sense. Okay, so Wilson's, the chapter that this came from is called The Future of Life and um, Wilson here is showing you um, a bunch of different living species and the interesting thing about this is all of these species that he shows are either um, have gone extinct or are headed in that direction and so he's asking you to think about um, the future of life usually when we say that we think about human life uh, but he's saying that 
really human life is just a subset of this broader uh, um, collection of living things on earth and really because we're facing this extinction crisis among different species, we're really facing a crisis that has to do with life itself. Um, so other authors in the environmental movement have written about the end of nature. Is nature still the same now that humans have transformed it so much? Um, and Wilson here is trying to get you to think about the end of life um, as we know it. And the um, point of the nature's last stand is the chapter you just read is that it's really down to the wire where humans have to make a choice of how we're going to um, either preserve or eliminate a lot of the rest of life on the planet. So what are our goals here? So we're trying to understand the different threats to the ecosystem um, and specifically the species extinction crisis, which is related intimately to the global warming crisis. And then secondly, I want you to think about some of the moral implications of species extinction. Okay, so what are our key points here? Uh, we're gonna go through these six points coming up, so this is just an outline, but we're gonna look at Hawaii. It's kind of a case study in degradation or massive changes in an uh, ecosystem. We're gonna look at the forces of extinction. That's uh, Wilson's hippo. Uh, we're gonna look at deforestation, the impact of global warming. Then he ends the chapter looking at different uh, invasive species, and then some more kind of philosophical questions and um, choices for humanity having to do with the future of life. Okay, so case study uh, in degradation, Hawaii. So there's a myth that an ecosystem is kind of this random collection of species. And I'd have you think about how is that inaccurate? How does, what does that miss? And I think what we'll see in uh, Wilson's discussion is that an ecosystem is typically something that has grown up over time and has been established by a long-term interaction of different species. And the species are added in a very slow way. So maybe one every uh, thousand years or something like that. And it's going to then um, have a very different set of properties than just some random collection of things. So some points to consider with Hawaii is the, the ge geographical history, the natural history, um, human history and the role of invasive species. So the geological origins of why it means it can, came about on its own um, in the middle of the Pacific um, um, from volcanic activity. So there's this volcano stuff going on and then as the plate is moving across it you get these little burps that end up becoming islands. Um, and so you can see how Hawaii is part of this long um, train of islands that were formed by the volcanic activity. So what's the significance of this? Well, it gives us kind of a almost perfect environment to see how an ecosystem comes into being and, and how it gets established because this land didn't used to exist and then it does exist and we can see what happened over time. So Wilson makes the point that it had a very different kind of ecology until humans got involved. And those humans got involved a long time ago. So we're talking about what we might call primitives or indigenous peoples getting in canoes and going across and landing in Hawaii. And so this has been going on for hundreds of years. This, is, this process of transformation started even before the Industrial Revolution by a long shot. And he talks about just two specific species that came over. One, uh, they brought over some pigs with them and the pigs were a food source and they were domesticated, but then the pigs got loose, look at them, they're running wild, um, and they became feral. So feral means it's a domesticated animal that then um, becomes undomesticated and it breeds in the wild. And you also call these like warthogs. Um, and then the ant came over um, just attached to the ships or in the cargo. Um, they weren't intentionally brought in, but they, they came along as uh, freeloaders. And, um, the ant is a very ferocious species. We might not think about that, um, but for the kind of smaller insects that it's going to compete with, uh, because of its social structure, it's a it's a formidable foe. So instead of having, because of its social structure, it's much like an army. So it can really gang up on other insects. And Wilson talks about the impact of both the ants and the warthogs. So the ways in which he talks about the ants making a difference is the ants 
come upon this environment where there's no other ants that have been here. And suddenly, these species that have been adapted to an environment that was ant-free are encountering this new kind of species, um, the ant. And the ant um, is able to kill off and radically transform uh, the environment on the more micro scale um, and eliminate most all their insects. And that has an impact on the birds that feed on those insects. So there's this chain reaction. And you'll see that lots of times because of the couplings you have among different species in an ecosystem. If one of them, um, if a change is introduced, it kind of ripples through the system. Same thing happened with the pigs. So one of the things the pigs will do is they will, if you've ever seen pigs, they like to root around in the dirt. I think this guy's thinking about rooting around. And that creates um, pockets or um, holes in the dirt that then fill with water. And then the water um, is a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes, which often carry malaria. And so then when the mosquitoes bite birds, the birds get malaria and many birds die. So again, it's a kind of a concept, it's a chain of events, but the pigs are messing up the environment because they're uh, introducing elements very quickly that weren't there before. So. An invasive species is one that um, is not native to a certain ecosystem and that comes in and transforms that ecosystem because the other elements of that ecosystem have not, through their evolutionary history, been adapted to dealing with um, that species. Okay, Wilson also talks about the forces leading to extinction and, and he comes up with the acronym HIPPO and he makes the point that people think pollution is the chief cause of species extinction, when in actuality, it's population. So just after a while, the sheer number of people on the planet or the specific ecosystem start to have an impact. And they, those people start to do things like destroy habitat, um, bring in other invasive species, pollute, over-harvest. But the pollution is in many ways kind of the root cause. And he talks about the... Um, Vancouver Island Marmot is an example of a species that's been affected um, by some of these insults, specifically the um, habitat destruction. So just to give you, um, I did some Googling to find you some more information about the Marmot. Um, it's a kind of rodent and it lives in um, Canada, uh, specifically near Vancouver, Canada, more specifically on Vancouver Island, which is a beautiful island um, that lies off the coast of uh, British Columbia here. And um, there's a Marmont Recovery Foundation that's working to save the cute little rodents. And you can see here they're releasing some into uh, a mountain environment um, after they've been, um, I think, raised in captivity. This guy is wondering about who his new neighbors are while he's having a little bit of a salad. And apparently you can adopt a Marmont. I'm not sure you can take them back to Rock Hill with you, but um, they want your help. And some Marmots apparently go skiing if you provide them with the right kind of gear. Okay, so back to Wilson's point. Um, what's going on with the Marmots? So it's this fascinating problem where they're not quite sure why they started declining and Wilson's saying what happened is because of some clear cutting that's where you go in and harvest some wood from a forest and you take all of it out as opposed to just a few select trees but in that clear cutting you get um, these patches that look like to the Miramont meadows so the little critter is scurrying down the mountain looking for a new um, home to set up shop and he comes across what he thinks is um, his natural habitat, but it's not. It's um, a habitat that's kind of a fake meadow that was created by this logging. And that meadow um, that he discovers that's artificial has different properties in the meadow that he is shooting for. And it has different predators and he ends up getting eaten more often than he would if he were in his natural environment. So these are kind of sinks where they suck in or attract the different marimots and then they do not populate as well um, because of the different um, pressures in that environment. Uh, so it, to make the point a little more specific, a mountain is not all one ecosystem. There's different ecosystems in a mountain depending on different kinds of things, but specifically at what height you are in the mountain. Different 
altitudes support different kinds of creatures and environments. If you've ever been hiking in a mountain, you can recognize that there's little sub ecosystems um, at the top of the mountain has different kind of plants than down in the valley and depending on how much shade an area gets. Even if you look at your lawn um, where you're growing grass, different kinds of grass and different mixtures of plants grow in different parts of the lawn. So uh, ecosystems can define a whole area like Hawaii, but you can also think about, remember that principle of nesting, that there's ecosystems within ecosystems. Okay, and then the golden toad is an example of an amphibian um, that is no longer with us. Um, it went extinct, I think it was last sighted sometime in the 80s, um, and it's part of this larger crisis that we're seeing with amphibians um, disappearing. And by some estimates, I think it's upwards of, they expect half of all frogs to disappear, frogs and salamanders. And they some of it is related to global warming, they think. There's a certain fungus that they're more likely to get attacked by. Wilson makes a point that they're kind of like canaries in a coal mine because since they breathe through their skin, they're very sensitive to any changes in um, the environment and they uh, are susceptible to getting things like um, viruses and infections and whatnot. Um, so some extinction forces here that brought the frogs demise about we're not quite um, sure about, but we can be fairly certain that traces back to um, some kind of human activity. Oh, one last point. When I say synergy here, synergistic insults, what that's suggesting is um, a synergy is when two things work together to bring about something that they wouldn't on their own. So in other words, these properties interact. If you have pollution and overpopulation of humans, um, that's going to do more damage than anything in isolation. Okay, get through the skiing marimots. Um, third thing Wilson talks about is the damage of deforestation. And he's um, so a myth might be that you could just save 10% of the Amazon forest and that's enough and you can kind of replace it as needed. He makes the point that when you cut down a large area to a smaller area, you have a, um, you're already eliminating different species because different species will live in different parts of the whole Amazon or part of the forest. And so you can't, even if you preserve just a chunk of it, you're already going to have lost a good chunk of the, the biodiversity that was there. So just a few um, pictures here. Um, the Amazon is huge. It's as big about as the continental United States. Um, it's a special kind of ecosystem that supports a really diverse range of species. That's in part because it's so tall that you have ecosystems existing at different layers based on height um, and then other factors that make it just a very complex interactive system that produces a lot of diversity. So. Some extensive points here, um, extensive biodiversity. Within 10 square kilometers of a rainforest, you have all the biodiversity that's represented in Europe. Um, that's pretty amazing. Now, some of that biodiversity isn't large exotic creatures, it's little insects, but they still count. Those still are different kinds of life. The rainforests are fragile because um, a lot of the nutrients are in are above ground, so they don't have as in the, the Midwest, say, a, a prairie kind of structure where a whole lot of organisms are living in the ground beneath the, the surface, most of the nutrients are above ground. So when you clear cut and when you pull out the trees themselves, you leave the uh, ecosystem very vulnerable. And Wilson talks about how winds blowing in from the side, if you take out the edges of the forest, can really dry out the forest very quickly um, and bring about its um, demise. So it's rich but fragile. Um, it's disappearing at the rate of about, um, they, he gives several estimates having to do with Florida. Some people say it's about twice the size of Florida every year. Some people say it's about half the size of Florida every year or about the size of Florida. But at any rate, it's a good chunk that's disappearing. And if you think about Florida relative to the size of that whole um, forest, it wouldn't take many years before all of this will be gone. Okay, and then another point about it is um, there's this um, recursive relationship uh, that moisture has in that the 
rain um, is not oftentimes coming in from outside the ecosystem. It's generated from perspiration of the trees. So there's some way in which the, the rainforest creates its own rain. And again, cutting into that, you want to think about cutting into the rainforest just kind of cutting into you. If I say, oh, I'm just going to cut off this arm, or I'm just going to cut off that leg, um, it's more integrated than you might think. And it's more, each part is more dependent on the whole than you might think. Okay, and then just a few other pictures here of um, rainforest. So see, these are some of the funky, interesting creatures that you'll see in a rainforest. You can tell that some of these have developed mimic properties to look like sticks, so they're less likely to get eaten. Um, I think this creature is probably mimicking different kinds of pokey spines on plants so you won't get eaten. This is the fishbone pattern of logging that Wilson talks about. Fishbone is what it looks like from the air where you have a main road and then you have these offshoots of it. And here's a picture of Brazil, kind of the heart of the Amazon, and the, the purple area here represents areas that have been deforested. So these are in some sense wounds you can think about that have really had an impact on um, uh, the, the whole ecosystem there. Uh, just a few more slides have some cute creatures that live there you have the huge um, amazon river obviously that goes through it um, and just another shot there with the fog laying in low okay so some damning statistics that um, wilson brings to you about hawaiian forests is the pre-human immigration rate uh, i'm just going to go ahead and slide these answers up here but the pre-human immigration rate to hawaii was uh, about one species every thousand years. So it's really slow and you can see how they could evolve uh, in each other's company and it kind of adapt to each other. So you had 8,790 insect and anthropod species. What percent of those are alien? 35%. What percent of the original forest is, has been lost worldwide? 50%. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, you had 50 square kilometers. In the 2000s, uh, you have 34 uh, million square kilometers, so a huge drop in the amount of forests. Um, the tropical rainforests, they, only, they have 6% of the land, but 50% of the known species. And every year we're losing about half the size of Florida or something like that. And I already mentioned this fact that Europe's plants and animals equal, all of the plants and animals in Europe equal just what you'll find in 10 square kilometers of a rainforest. So they're kind of like a bank or it's like a gold mine where it's some of the best stuff on earth are in those rainforests and they're very vulnerable. Here's some deforestation we can see happening in um, Central America going back from the 1950s, uh, 1990s, 2000s. You can see just how much of that green has disappeared. Okay, and then he also spent some time talking about global warming. His numbers are a little dated, so the chapter is a bit older, but it's still the same basic phenomenon, sadly enough. Um, if I slide these answers in here for you, um, degrees of years, temperature fluctuation for 10,000 years post ice age. Um, so in the last 10,000 years, in other words, we've had two degrees, kind of the temperature bouncing around. Um, the increase from 15, uh, 100 to 1990 has been 0.9 degrees and then another 0.9 degrees from 1900 to 2000. The concentration levels of CO2 are the highest in the 400,000 year span. And here's the frightening stuff that the predicted increase uh, could be uh, 2.5 degrees or it could be as much as 10.4 degrees by the year 2100. So if it's 10.4 degrees, we're going to see major huge changes and even huge changes at just 2.5 degrees. Okay, so some um, other things he talks about towards the end of the chapter are invasive species and he does this pros and cons thing and that's really just kind of to show you that there aren't many pros to invasive species. There's not a lot of good that they do. Um, there's a myth that you can fix certain problems by adding a species to adjust to a certain thing. So for example, um, this over here on the right is kudzu, and kudzu was brought in to deal with soil erosion. So they wanted to plant it and it would hold the, the hillside intact. But since the local um, species and other plants whatnot um, had not uh, evolved in the presence of kudzu, kudzu can take over. So here you see a car almost being eaten by kudzu. And you can see this in many um, towns as you drive around in the south, just fields that are just at where everything from telephone poles to houses to if you're slow enough, you could be covered in kudzu. And then um, the rosy 
uh, wolf snail was brought in to um, deal with some other creatures, but it ended up just a, um, being a terrible predator towards other um, species. And the um, turgy was one of the species they tried to save uh, by bringing it into captivity, and it didn't make it. So they had a post, a sign that said 1.5 million years um, before Christ to January 1996. So it's, that's a tombstone that's not just saying the death of one uh, creature, but it's the death of a whole line of creature that's been around for millions of years, uh, which has, as we'll talk about later, some, some moral implications. And then there's another um, story that, I, that Wilson covers that I think is interesting, and that's the person that loved Shakespeare so much that he wanted to introduce all the songbirds of Shakespeare that's mentioned in the different Shakespeare's plays um, into New York. Um, so that's this kind of romantic understanding of, of birds and song and uh, nature that was inconsistent with the way ecosystems work. And that romantic gesture, even though I'm sure it was made in with the best of intentions, um, has caused many problems because you introduced a species that the rest of the ecosystem has a hard time dealing with. So. At the end of the chapter, Wilson gives you two distinct views of what could happen in the future. And one of them is a thing where we've learned to adapt and, and live within certain bounds. Um, and the others um, talks about leaving a really degraded, um, ruined landscape for our ancestors. And so as someone who has um, a child and wants future generations to enjoy the planet, um, it's poignant it's a, and it should make you stop and think about what we want to do. So one loose end I wanted to mention, I know in your reading questions we t asked you which locales are in particular danger. Um, so one place that's in danger uh, would be species on mountains um, because you can move higher and find colder temperatures, but at some point um, species that are adapted to certain temperatures, you can only go so high and then the mountain ends, right? Or if you think about um, species that exist at certain latitudes, um, and if things warm up, you can move north, but only to a point, and then you're going to run out of planet. So, in other words, warming is going to affect different creatures and different um, ecosystems in different ways, depending upon um, what their boundary conditions are. Okay, so do we have an extinction crisis or a moral crisis or both? So Wilson is telling you that by some estimates, half of all species are going to be extinct by 2100. In other words, half of all life on Earth is going to be gone. Wilson has a critique of the sacred text where he's not He's not saying they're worthless, but he's saying that by and large, the, the Bible and the Quran, uh, the New and Old Testaments uh, were written before we really understood or faced the kind of ecological problems we face today. So to just give you a point, um, Jesus is talking in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 28, saying, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or your, about your body, what you will wear. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Well, what Wilson is saying is the clock is ticking, and the heavenly Father appears not to be feeding the birds like he used to. So when you're messing with the globe in a way where even certain scripture texts that were written 2,000 years ago aren't going to have the same meaning that they once did, we could say that that's a pretty profound transformation of the planet. Another related point on that is if nature is this drastically changed, it really calls into question what we even mean by natural. So it's um, possible that if nature changed that drastically, even to think about what's human nature or who we are, all those things start um, feeling like you're adrift and that there's no shoreline anymore that gives you a point of reference. Okay, so we're going to do a few slides here on what I call um, ecological thinking or systems thinking. At this point, we're stepping a little further away from the way biologists would use the term properly to think um, a little more broadly about it. So. One of the ways that systems thinkers think about this is that biology is, offers a certain kind of model that's different than physics. In other words, biology is looking at um, a way in which systems are nested within systems where you have parts of organisms, organisms, communities of organisms. Um, it's giving you a way 
to think about how all these things fit together. Um, in contrast to the physics, if you understand physics is just this thing hits that thing and then this thing hits that thing and there's not these systemic properties. So some of these basic systemic principles that we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, you have the idea that reality is dynamic. So in other words, processes determine material conditions. Um, you think about weather, for example, or metabolism, or the temperature of the planet. A lot of these realities are the outcomes of a set of forces interacting, and dynamic means they're ever-changing and they're in flux. Um, we also have this principle that things are networked, so the something is what it is because of the interdependent web that it's um, located within. So um, the nature of the insects in Hawaii changed drastically once you had ants introduced because those interdependent webs changed. Um, and then also we have this point that it's things are recursive. It's not that you have parts, it's that you have each thing as a system within a larger system. So some other kind of systems we can think about, economies oftentimes function as systems where they have overall properties that come into being. Um, so you can talk about an unemployment rate that, that comes about or a GDP that comes about through the interaction of all kinds of complex factors that form an economy. You can talk about families as having systemic properties. So um, the interaction of a mother two kids, a father, a dog, and a hamster, it's going to be more complex and it's going to have more properties than just those individuals on their own. Cultures and languages have properties of systems. Um, so cultures are, uh, are things that evolve and change over time and dictate the behaviors of individuals in them. Languages are things that evolve and change over time and have a lot of complexity. And then you think about organizations um, like Winthrop or the state of South Carolina or um, physicians as a, as a body, as an organization, um, all kinds of things like that can have systemic properties. Okay, so some specific visions of systems thinking that would be helpful for you to know. Um, a classic is the Gaia hypothesis. Gaia is, um, the Gaia hypothesis was uh, introduced by a guy named James Lovelock, and it's named after the Greek earth goddess, and he's trying to get you to think about the earth as a living organism. So the whole thing is a living organism. So in that sense, we can think about uh, geophysiology. So like you have a physiology, the way in which your body interacts and, and maintains itself. Same thing for the earth. So there's this idea that you have a complex, dynamic, oh, that got cut off there. Whoops. Homeostatic. It should be homeostatic system. It's self-regulation of the atmosphere is what he's looking at in particular. So we did this thing called daisy world modeling where if you remember your grade school physics, black absorbs more heat than white. So if we imagine the heat of the sun is going with this dotted line, what will happen within a certain band, the, the planet and his modeling of this on a computer will change the percentage of white versus black daisies um, to adjust to the different temperatures that the sun is throwing at it so that in within some band, see this flat line here, within some range, it can be a self-adjusting system, a self-regulating system, so that the system can maintain a certain kind of um, stability despite changes in the input. So that's one version of systems thinking. Um, it's not technically in a literal sense true, but it captures some of the essence of trying to think in terms of holes that have emergent properties um, rather than just the earth as being a collection of separate pieces or parts. Um, one of my favorites is, um, in terms of system thinkers, is a guy named Gregory Bateson. Um, and he was doing a lot of writing back in the 60s and 70s. Um, he had a famous book called Mind and Nature, and he was trying to think about um, human thought as a part of ecology. So in other words, you have dolphins and elephants. Well, human thinking enters into and becomes part of the ecosystem that these other creatures live in. And so we tried to find some parallels between the way nature behaves and the way our mind behaves. And you can think about there's some similarities, right? They're both dynamic systems. They're selective. There's certain things they pay attention to and certain things they don't. And they're trying to make sense of something. And there's a, a synthesis and a distilling and a um, evolving property to them. Um, he thinks about the mind as this thing that emerges within nature as opposed to like the mind of God or the mind of humans as 
coming first and being able to step outside of nature. And he also thinks about the mind as potentially pathological. So in other words, we can adopt certain ways of thinking that really lead to dangerous outcomes. And one of the things he picked on or, or criticized was a very, the kind of thinking that's conscious and linear but that doesn't recognize systemic interactions. So the kind of thinking that says, me want that, me get that. Well, that could um, maybe help you get that thing, but you may not recognize all the damage that you're doing in the process of getting it. Um, so just an example of his kind of thinking here, and this is more heuristic than, a, a th say, a model you could run out and test, but he's saying here there's this interaction, there's a set of um, systems and together a larger system where you have population dynamics, the number of people on the planet, technology, um, the kinds of things that, that come about when you have a lot of people, and then hubris, this idea, this kind of arrogance that humans are wonderful things, that we can control our environments, and you see how they all kind of feed on each other, but then they throw off these side effects we may not like, like famine, war, pollution, are all things that can come about through um, the interaction of these specific things. So just to think about this, um, think about the effect of cars and what cars do. Um, the more people you have, the more cars you have. Cars make us think about ourselves as things that can get around on their own, that kind of feed into that idea that we can conquer the world and get where we want to get on our own. But there's a certain lot of pollution that comes about from cars. And maybe because the money we spend on cars, we're not spending it on things that we could do to prevent famine and, and such. Okay, and then a few other points here. Um, deep ecology is a concept that um, Arne Ness has written about. Arne Ness was a philosopher, Norwegian philosopher. And um, this is arguing against, obviously, shallow ecology. And shallow ecology is thinking about the world in terms of just a set of resources um, that humans can use. And the deep ecology is trying to get you to ask deeper questions, question certain kinds of assumptions, um, like maybe do species have some kind of intrinsic value that's different than their use value for humans? And he takes certain concepts like democracy and tries to make it more inclusive so that you can imagine species as being something that we should try to include in a democracy, other species besides humans. And he also talks about self-realization is not an individual um, process that you might think about a self-help book helping you with, but self-realization is seeing yourself in the larger whole of nature and realizing that in a way that connects you with that larger whole. Um, close related to that, uh, Warwick Fox has an idea of, um, talks about transpersonal psychology. So trans meaning across. So a kind of psychology that's more than just the psychology of individuals. He points to um, Abraham Maslow, you might have heard about. Uh, Maslow, Maslow had the hierarchy of needs in this idea of self-actualization. But towards the end of his life, um, he was realizing that some of the self-actualized individuals were kind of egocentric, they were kind of selfish. They kind of had an atomistic, um, self-centered view of the world. And that they kind of one of the best outcomes for them and the ones they love, but maybe not. They maybe weren't thinking past that. Well, he identified these folks he called transcenders that, that somehow reach past that individualism and connect it with a larger whole. And his articulation of, of transpersonal psychology was an attempt to kind of express that uh, those folks that embrace that larger reality. All right, and then later in the course, we're going to examine some specific, um, some specific systems where we can see how human psychology influences and shapes those systems, and how those shaped them, how those shaped them, shaped them, how those systems shape human psychology. So we'll look at. Um, suburban sprawl and cars and how the density of cities affects the kind of transit systems that we can have, um, but basically looking at the concept of dwelling. And dwelling is, you know, just how we live inside structures and space. And then we'll also look at eating and we'll look at um, industrial agriculture, fast food versus different models of sustainable farming.